The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Adam lay face down on the ground. In pain, he had this pressure on his shoulders and neck and head, pushing his face down into the dirt and rocks under, underneath his head. It's not all that different from what a, a cop might need to do to subdue a, a criminal and get control over someone. Put your hands over your head, they said, and they might say, get in face down. Lie face down on the ground, put your hands on the top of your head, right? Before they handcuff them and throw them in the back of the cab. That's not all that different from what Adam was going through. He was owned and oppressed. He was conquered. And what makes matters worse is he wasn't the only one. Adam had a lot of enemies. And this enemy boot was what was squishing his head. He had an oppressor. He had an enemy who had charge over him pushing his face down into the ground. It's that ancient Orient picture of the triumphant king. You displayed your power. You showed your victory by putting your foot on your conquered foe. And this is Adam, stuck underneath of the boot of the heel of his enemy, whose name was Death. What makes it worse is he wasn't alone in this. Adam's hands, off to the side, in weakness, were joined to your hands, to my hands, to the people of all people everywhere, to the whole world, the whole human race is connected to that Adam underneath death's might and power. Can you imagine what that might have been like for Adam to live 930 years teaching people about why death was such a force in our lives? Can you imagine how often he would have to teach and explain where this powerful death came to be? Can you picture a squished face a few feet away meeting Adam's eyes and saying, now how did we get into this predicament again? How do we get into this trouble? with death having such control and such success among humanity? Aren't we the crown of God's creation? Couldn't death just be something that happened to animals or happened to plants? But it happens, it happens among us and with great effect and with great might and force in each one of our lives. Adam's Bible was really short at the time, but it, he had everything in it. Do you think he told people the truth or would hide it from them, where this power of death came from? Adam taught faithfully many people, of many generations, looking them in the eye with their fellow squished faces and saying, yes, even I brought this. We disobeyed our God. Death is here. Death is our enemy. Death is this powerful force in our lives because we disobeyed God. And as a consequence to our sin, God's punishment is death. For dust we are, now to dust we shall return. And if you have the chance to sort of strain your head against the boot that's squishing you around, the boot of death, you might look up and see we've got other enemies over against us. I, I've got... We have another enemy. There's Sin up there. I don't know if you can see Sin. I think his shoe is digging into my left shoulder. That's a powerful force at work in our lives. You see that one too, don't you? Oh, and there's Satan. He's got his heel into my shoulder blade on the right. I don't know if you can get a good look at him, but watch out for him. He's the one who deceived us, and he still gets us with his schemes and his lies. He's going to come to you. You probably ex should expect this. He'll invite you to be pain-free. He'll, he'll tell you that he has a way out of your situation, but he's really lying. He's not going to help you at all. He loves having you under his foot. Oh, and that pain you feel all over your body, that's the big shoe. That's pain. That's pain itself. 
That's trouble and evil at work. It spreads everywhere in our lives. It affects everything. There is nothing under the sun that we can find full satisfaction in. There is nothing here that will bring us true and lasting joy. It's all stained. It's all ruined. As soon as you invent something, it works against you. As soon as you split the atom, they have a weapon of mass destruction. As soon as we have cars, now we have accidents and tragedies with them. Nothing works just forward. Nothing just takes us and, and heals us. This, this is our slavery and these are our masters. We're like puppets on a string. And it's our own fault. Doesn't that help you see the big forest of our problem as mankind? So often in the Bible it personifies death and sin and pain and these powerful forces that are at work in our lives, and we can do absolutely nothing about them. We've got our squished faces. They're, they're pinning us down in, in conquering might over us. Sometimes in our lives, we, we, we forget that big force. We forget those big problems, and we, we, we just see these little trees that are bothering us in our lives. And even among Christians and in Christian churches, the whole agenda is about perhaps looking to God's Word for help in our relationships, looking to God's Word for help in, in making better decisions in life, looking to God's Word for comfort in the latest national tragedy that we're going through. And, and that's what the church is all about. Does it seem to you that sometimes the church is reduced to its, its mission of, of just food drives and small group therapy and, and do good to others as you'd have them do unto you? If that happens and happens among us, we've missed the forest of the king. We're totally ignoring what's really squishing us down into the ground. What if we could solve all of society's ills and fix all of the problems in our world? What would we gain if we could gain the whole world but yet had to forfeit our souls and remained under the foot of death and sin? What would it be if God's kingdom were limited to this, this life? If all that God could give you in his rule and power and might was a little bit of medication, pain meds before death came, making you comfortable before death had the last word? The Apostle Paul rushes to tell us that God is a far greater king than that, that our God takes us far beyond just the things of this life. He shows us and reminds us of this forest, of our Christ, the King. He tells us what good news from our God is all about. There were some Corinthian believers who began to be deceived that even though Christ was raised, that somehow they weren't going to rise, that somehow there's this teaching among them that Paul has to write about, that there was no resurrection from the dead, that there's nothing to look forward to after this life. And he has to address it. And he does that in 1 Corinthians 15. We have a lot more for hope in God than just the things of this life. It's far more glorious than that. Here we are, these little Christians in a little Grace Lutheran church on a typical, regular Sunday of the year, and yet we call it Christ the, Sing, Christ the King Sunday. And what rang out from our mouths? What message was on our lips? Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout to the rock of our salvation, for the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. Yes, Paul says, and in this section, listen, as he unrolls the scroll of the great glory of God to show you the big forest of your king. And it's written as the wonderful plan of God the Father from eternity, and it's all spelled out in one precious word. The Christ. The Christ. You recognize that as a name for Jesus, don't you? It's the name for Jesus that Paul uses almost exclusively in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He wants you to think about the Christ. 
It's not just another proper name for Jesus. It's a descriptive name. It's a title that is given to Jesus. It means that he's the anointed one. He's the appointed one by God, the chosen one by God. Jesus, this earthly Jesus of Nazareth, was the man for the job. Well, for what job? What was the Christ to do? The Christ was to be king. The Christ was to rule. The Christ was to have all enemies put under his feet. Tell me, the Son of God, does he not rule all things already? From eternity has he not been King of kings and Lord of lords? And as soon as he spoke light into being, the Son of God ruled the light. And as soon as he made the sun and the moon and the stars, he ruled the sun and the moon and the stars and told them what to do. There's, ne there's never been a time when something else was king. The Son of God has always ruled over the plants, over the animals, over the human race, over all angels, anything made that is not God, anything that he has created, he's already ruled it. So what is this Paul doing that says that he, this Christ, this one who would come, must put everything under his feet? It's because the Christ is all about being your king. The Christ who was king from eternity came to be not just the Son of God, but also Mary's son. Do you see what he does? He must reign over your enemies by his own promise, by his own decision and will. The Christ had his assignment, had his appointment by the Father, the plan that he must take up your enemies in our flesh and blood. Do you see him in the picture as Adam and all humanity crushed under the weight of many enemies and powers and forces in our life that are well beyond our control? Do you see this Jesus coming and joining hands with us in the midst of us, living among us, and taking every boot from every face of every enemy and putting them one by one on his own face, crushing himself under their own bow, every single sin, all temptation of Satan, every hurt and pain you feel in your life, and every death we can die. Jesus took the boot, the heel, and he shouldered it for us. He let it squish his face into the dirt. This is the loving grace and the pure goodness of God that he would do such a thing. And they mocked him for it. And they jeered him for it. Those people who in this life sigh, and what is this world coming to, and what is our king possibly doing? And people who hold on to their little trees that they want for themselves, their self-made utopias, and comforts and pleasures that you want to keep in this life. And they rejected the king of the forest. They rejected the Christ and crucified him. And he died. And his death was so real and so certain that he was buried. And if Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile. If Jesus remains in that grave, we have no hope from our enemies our big forest enemies. That's the truth. Because you know what would have happened next? After leaving Jesus locked in his tomb, death would have just moved on to you and me. Just Death would have just come back and put the shoe right back on your face after finishing off Jesus. That's what would have happened next. But Paul says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. It proves that not only did he take all of these enemies on his face, but this is what his resurrection means. This is the significance that it has for us. Not only did he take all these enemies as his own and he set us free and we're, we're left standing by his side to watch and observe this, 
but he takes those boots and he throws them down and he hurls our enemies down on their backs one by one, rolls them on their faces and throws his foot on their necks. He fights them for us. He wages war against them and he won the battle and his resurrection from the dead is your proof that Christ is victorious as king. More than just the Son of God who is and reigns and never ceases to reign, but also in the flesh, God for you, God connected to you, God joined to you. So Paul sings this triumph song in this lesson that just as Christ is raised, Christ first, so those who belong to him shall be raised. What a glorious day as Jesus reverses death in our lives because he's connected to us with death under his feet. And so it is with all of our enemies that here in this world, Jesus points us to himself, longs for us to put our trust and hope in the Christ, the one who has connected himself to us and says, I forgive you all your sins by my authority over your sins. And he says it to us in baptism, and he says it to us in the Lord's Supper, and over and over again on a weekly basis. And he comes to us in the Word, and every little pain, and every little trouble, and every little hurt, he reminds us and says to those joined to him, in Christ, you conquer these pains. In Christ, you have your foot. All of these troubles and pains must serve you. They must serve your good in your life. That's my power. That's the Christ. That's this King. And he gives you the word of his truth to fight off the lies of Satan. Christians, stand with Christ and look from side to side at the enemies defeated under the feet of Christ your King. There is no more highly exalted person in the entire world than the Christian because of Christ. We are not to be pitied more than any person. We are to be envied by all. And that day is coming when that second Adam will return and he'll take these enemies that he has now and forever underneath his feet, he'll take them and he'll drag them to the cliff and he'll hurl them all to the abyss to be no more. And death will die. And pain will be no more. And temptation will not happen ever again. All cut off, all destroyed, all never appearing in the presence of the Christ in heaven, the living Christ and his living people. The Christ is ever with them. The daylight is serene. The pastures of the blessed are ever rich and green. There is the throne of David, and there from care released, the shout of them that triumph, the song of them that feast, to God enthroned in glory, the church's voices blend. The Lamb forever blessed, the light that knows no end. Amen. Would you please stand?